Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Lance, welcome to Inside the Firm, inside our new headquarters. Have we recorded here yet? I don't think, I think we, we did upstairs. We did upstairs, yeah, when we what, what, closed the yep. last time. But now we're in the conference room. So this is where we're going to be podcasting. It's awesome. I'm very excited. How, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good except for this glass because table. Because it's not the whole side. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's, we made these really cool custom tables. Um, shout out to Matic Metal. They did the uh, the bases for this. Um, we we designed them in house. They're they're like raw steel, but then the tops are uh, three and a half inch wide by eleven and seven eighths deep LVLs. They're super beefy. They're super industrial. And we're gonna put a piece of glass on there. And then, but until we close out financials and figure <laughs> stuff out in life, because we had that one unit go down, so it's just been craziness. That's a nice foreshadow. We Boom. are uh, we are uh, eventually gonna get a full glass top. Yep. And the LVLs are left over from the site, so we just kept them, stored them, and we'll have have three tables from it. Um, so besides using LVLs as tables, our firm has always used Dell. It has as our computer source. Dell's the best. I have Dell's. You have Dell's. And as a Dell partner inside the firm, listeners. And their firms. So your whole firm is eligible for valuable discounts on Dell technology products and services. So visit, guys, you need to do this. You need to visit dell.com forward slash inside the firm. If you aren't remembering that, go to inside the firm and there'll be a link there. Select the technology you need to fuel your business. You can also call Dell at 1 800 757 8442. Um, and then just tell them that you're an inside the firm listener and provide your member <laughs> ID, which I will get to you right now because it's on inside the firm podcast.com, but I don't have that up, but he's going to have it up very soon. Yeah. It, the internet on this Dell works very, very well, <laughs> right? So it is okay. It's on, it's there, but I'll give it to you. It's five, three, zero, zero, one, five, seven, zero, four, seven, five, nine. There you go. Dell. This episode is also brought to you by Arcat. Arcat.com is the place to go when the time has come for your firm to begin gathering product and material information for its next project. Let's say you're tasked with finding the top window manufacturers and they need to have CAD, BIM, and specifications. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a search engine that showed you who had the data you need? There is. It's arccat.com, the number one most used website for finding building product information, search for a product or even a CSI section and get a list of manufacturers and the data they offer. Even better, you can download all that technical data for free. You don't even have to register to use Arccat. Save your firm time, money, and frustration. Go to arccat.com and start building better content today. That's A-R-C-A-T.com. Arccat.com. Nice. What are we here to talk about today? I'll tell you what you're here to talk about today. I'll answer my own questions all the time for you. Uh, clauses that can save your butt. That's the first thing I like to talk about. Okay. So when you're selling a project, you, you that have you have con- built, you have your contract, and there's a whole bunch of legal terms in there and legal definitions. It's like five, seven pages long. Some of these can be very, 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 very important. And Lance, are you looking it up? Is that why you're... Uh, I will in one second. Yeah, that's exactly what I was yeah. doing. Keep going. Keep so going. we learned this from other developers and it, here's why it's important, right? So when you're doing a project that gets involved more people than maybe just two, and who knows? Who, who knows if you can even agree with two people? Who knows if you can even agree with yourself? But you don't know if people are going to be unreasonable or not. And there are unreasonable people. Think yep. about like any troll right think think about for example you can be on the left or the right it doesn't matter so let's say you're on one side there's someone that's going to troll your candidate or your politics no matter what no matter what doesn't matter could be the most reasonable thing could be the most unreasonable thing they are going to troll no matter what so if you're selling you might have that equivalent that no matter what nothing can make 
that person happy, right? So what do you do in that situation? Honestly, what do you do in that situation? And it could be a client, it could be you're selling something, and and, and it gets to the point where like, oh, you accommodate, or you make things better, and let's say they get even more mad. So like you've improved, but they've even got more mad. And how long does that go on? And then what can you do to protect yourself? You got to have your out is what he's getting out, right? So everybody has, in our in our architectural contact contract, we have um, something that says like any party upon written agreement can cancel this contract. Written notice. Written notice, yeah. I'd have to pull up the exact language, but the point is is to have an out. And then to to... to to circle back on Alex talking about how you can't foreshadow, you really can't predict what people are going to be like. They could be nice all the way through. Think about like the first time you meet somebody when you're going to, when you have a sales meeting with, with a, with a potential client, everybody wants to get along. Everybody's excited about the project, but then, then remind yourself about what it's like to go through trials and tribulations, let's say during the project, let's say you're uh, permitting in a very urban area with a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of, and so many nuances in their zoning and building codes that it is almost impossible, and a lot of times it is, for you to know every single tiny little nuance. And let's say one critical thing gets missed. And then let's say you get down to the last set of comments and the building department goes, oh, even the building department, even the building official says, oh, I caught that item and it's a deal breaker for the project. I feel like this is coming from a personal place. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's say that exactly happens. Right. And so emotions are going to be high. They're going to be, they're going to be very, very high at that point. Right. And at the end of the project, what if, what if you guys end up just literally not liking each other whatsoever from a professional standpoint, maybe even a personal, because who knows what happened during that you got to have your way out. You got to have it so that you you can everybody can hopefully mutually walk away and just say this isn't this isn't working for me. So so we put something we put all of these different points in in our sales contract. Our sales contract for these with these townhomes is 22 pages long. So one of the ones we put in, can I read it? Is that okay? Yeah. I think it's fine. Is it says So uh, this is, some people that we sold to it's been awesome. Like and I mean one of the most thrilling things like I've experienced so far. Uh, one person we walked through was jumping around her condo because she was so excited about it. And I, that was the first time that anybody had joy on the site in a long time. And Alex and I were exhausted. And so to see that and then for her to be just like, I love it. Like to hear that. So that was on the small building. Yeah. you That happened on the big building too. No, no. On the big building is where it happened. On the top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So... To hear that was like, I don't know, it was really thrilling. Like, it was actually really touching. Like, I got kind of emotional because I was like, wow, fine. Like, somebody appreciates what we did. Like, I feel like nobody appreciates what we did, right? Yeah. But there's the opposite. There is the opposite. And so we're going through these punches with people. And some, one entity is, almost has a hundred things to touch up. First, we're at, when we went through them with them, we were go, you know, we were obviously dejected and a little bit disappointed but then Alex and I do what we try to do best run right our problems solve them we got that punch us down to like three items I'm not joking down from like almost a hundred down to three items two day two and a half days of me and you in that place fixing stuff even doing extra stuff going above and beyond they're still not happy so this is why it's important to have an out okay so this is a very important out if anybody's ever doing for sale single family homes I, or any kind of building, I think you should have this clause in there, okay? So ours says, within a year after closing, seller will correct warrantable items to industry standards. Industry standards is pretty critical. Seller will inform buyer of the solution the seller will perform and the cost of the correction. Buyer can accept the correction or accept the monetary costs of the correction to correct the sellers at the seller's this direction. If the buyer chooses to do receive the money amount, the buyer releases the seller from all future claims of that item. If a dispute arises from this work or any other work associated with the property, within the first year, the seller can initiate a return of the property back to the seller in exchange for payment back to the buyer of the purchase price plus infl inflation. As such, 
rate of inflation is determined by the U.S. Labor Department. So seller can, what was it? Seller can what? Seller, let me say it again. So seller can, what was it? The initiate part. Yep. Initiate. Uh, let's see if the buyer chooses to receive them, blah, 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 blah. It's like the th- second to last, third to last. If second. a dispute arises from this work or any other work associated with the property within the first year, the seller can initiate a return of the property back to the seller in exchange for payment back to the buyer of the purchase price plus inflation. I really like the idea that it's of the purchase price too, because what if the property actually during their appraisal came in higher than their purchase price, right? They're not going to, they're not going to obviously inflate their loan. It it just looks good to them because they have almost instant equity. Yeah. Right. Yep. Another key. And, and what I honestly think will happen is, and, and, and let me be clear, this is an extreme. It's not, oh, we did the punch list and then we decided Oh, anything they say, we're not going to do again. No, no. There's another one that, oh, we've done a punch list, but there's a couple other things that we just missed. Okay. We'll touch we'll on them. We'll fix them up. up. No, no big no deal. No problem. Yep. It's, it's, hey, we improved it. Now they're getting more mad, threatening, and all that. But, but what I think will happen is, hey, we, um, there's going to be two options because the first option is that this is the, your home. So either now you're responsible for your home because we've already done these punchless items and we'll write something up that we're, we're not doing that or else we really like your home and we're going to buy back your home. Yep. Yep. So you still got to have some teeth to enforce just getting to an understanding because everybody who's ever built a building or anybody who's even just, just lived in a house for God's sakes, I think you understand that like you, it's never done. And it's never done because you're never done living, right? So, like, your kid is going to break something. You're, you, there's going to be blunt. You're going to just find stuff. Buildings are going to settle. They're going to wear. But at some also, point, where, when are you done? A building is not machined. It's still handmade. So, uh, I mean, handmade is handmade. That is what it is. Yeah. It's not an iPhone. That- my, my wife had this. Uh, my wife just bought, she, she, she did a... Oh, I forget what they're called. 5013C or something. No, it's like a nonprofit. There's a 1084 exchange or 1083 exchange. So you can you can sell an existing property that you have and then you can buy new Reinvest. ones of equ- equivalent, basically, right? And then you have, there's these tax loopholes and stuff. <coughs> so she just did that because I've been encouraging her. Some of her properties in the mountains in Colorado, and we don't live in the mountains. We live in the front range. I'm like, you need to have more local control over your projects and, and your property. Like you need to be able to go, if there's an emergency, you can go drive there and take care of it she's like so she's finally convinced and so she bought two townhomes and she, she she's going through walkthroughs so she's on like two different sides of this you know she's selling our stuff and then she's actually buying other stuff and she was lamenting with the other realtor about how much they both hated walkthroughs even even though she's going through the walkthrough and like picking out things that are wrong and need to be slightly fixed and the the other realtor uh turns to her and says um he goes yeah i've had let me tell you a story. And he, he tells her about this one, this buyer from some other property they were looking at. And they noticed that the wall bowed a little bit, right? Because the stud maybe was bowed out too much, put the wrong There's way actually out. industry standards for that. Like it's allowed to bow. Uh, see, Alex is just, <laughs> I guarantee he's on the ball looking at these yeah. industry standards. Yeah. Right? So you National can, Association of Home Builders. It's something like a quarter or a half inch. Like it it just happens. Industry it's, standards. It's wood. It's Damn wood. It. <laughs> It's yeah. wood. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't quote me on the size, but like. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's super interesting. Um, so anyway, so he goes, he goes, I had a person look at this wall and they were like, it's bowed. And they want, they, they were trying to demand that they redo the whole wall. And he's like, no, he's like, no, there's, there's certain thing. He goes, so what he ended up coming to the conclusion of, and I thought was absolutely brilliant. And then I told Alex um, earlier this week in a, in a very early morning meeting he and I had, I go. He was because Alex was installing this um, uh, heat nest. Con- Thermos- a, a, a thermostat nest. Yeah, a nest. And he was installing it, and I go, you know what's interesting, Al? And I told him told him the story, and I go, what that guy told my wife is that he said, we are so used to and so spoiled at this point in 2019. There's so many things that are machine made, so they're almost perfect, if not perfect. Probably you'd have perfect. to look under a microscope, right, to really see some imperfections at this point on certain things. Yeah. He goes. One of the one of the only things that's handmade anymore is a, is a building. 
it's truly handmade, you know? And we talk about like 3D printers all day long on this podcast, hoping for that. So we get to that point because maybe, maybe our punch lists are quicker, easier. We don't yeah. have to deal with crazy, crazy, crazy subs and stuff like that. But at this, so I think this is a really valuable lesson. And, and just, I would take this with me wherever I go if, if I was a listener, because we're going to apply this from now on in our thinking of like, these are handmade. Like it's one of the last things. So there's going to be imperfections. There's no... You can't guarantee it. You can tr- you just try your best. Yep. Yep. So then, um, I don't know. Let's do a hard transition into loans. <laughs> <Unless you> want- <laughs> no, no, no. I got one. I got one. Yeah. So I want to, I want to touch, we can go into loans next. Uh, cause we're trying to wrap up how this thing closes out and how we, how we go into, how we go into the next year to try to finish this last unit that got flooded. If you listen to one of the last episodes it's called don't go chasing waterfalls. It's where we go over like what, what what happened. It was a catastrophe. Anyway, so we've been dealing with insurance, and I've learned a couple things dealing with insurance. Number one, if you have let's say let's say your property, it doesn't matter if you're a, it's your own house or you're building one or whatever, maybe you're contracting it even, and you have to do your uh, builder's insurance. Is if there's damage to it, there's um, there's two different things you have to do, right? You're gonna have to rebuild it, so there's gonna be that part of the claim. And then there's going to be, if you're like us, where we have, we're now we're going to have to carry a balance on our loan. That there's the ins- the interest that you that will be accumulated from the time of when you should have sold the unit to when you are projecting you will sell the unit, based on the reconstruction and everything. What from a contractor standpoint, I've been putting together, I've walked all the subs through multiple bu- subs through the unit. They've all came to their conclusions on what they think they need to do to get their job done and everything. When I first submitted what uh, the portion of our claim for that, it was all the subcontractors' uh, bids, but I prefaced it with the contractor, that's us, and I gave a written narrative of what happened. And when the underwriter looked at it, she was she said, "Here's you need a couple. You need to add a couple things." And the biggest one was you have to stress that you're doing all of this and you have to do all this stuff because of the flood. Like it has to be very explicit. So even if it was a fire, God, then you got to be explicit about the fire. Yep. Uh, vandals came in, got to be explicit about that. Oh, it was vandalized. And that's why we're having to do all this. Mm-hmm. So I had to expand our narrative, number one. And then the other thing we did is we put some line items in for, we're going to do all the finished carpentry because that's what we did on the rest of the units. And it's, it's more work we can do, so we're going to do it, and we know what we're doing. Um, so I put a line on him from there. I just put a number. And they're like, nope, need to break it down. You need to tell me how many hours you think it's going to take. What's your hourly rate is, blah, 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 blah. So there was a couple other subs that I also had to get after, and they had to list out materials. Um, those subs are ones we've used before, so they, they, they were just like, we all just know what things should cost. So if they give me a lump sum, I'm like, yeah, I know. That's, that's where you should be. Just yeah. like a square footage basis. Here's a question. Where's that at? When are we going to get a word? Oh, I emailed them today again. And I said, hey, hey, we're closing the last unit out today. The interest the interest is going to start ticking from here on out. So, Boy. you know, that's coming. Like, you know that you guys are going to be responsible for paying the interest because that's part of the claim. Like, there's no way around it. Yeah. And uh, no, I haven't heard back. So, insurance sucks. I mean, you got to have it, but... Man, pretty painful. Yeah. I I would love to start. We have subs ready to go, Al. So I'm going to call them after this podcast. You happy about that? I would. Okay. It, feel free for them if 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 they want to hire someone else and get that back up to 100% complete because that's where it was. Then insurance like, company? Yeah. yeah. Like like it was 100% complete. Get it back to 100% complete. This is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. It's totally crazy. Yeah. So while Lance is doing that, I'm working with to get a loan on our building um, so that we can free up some cash uh, and do some other things with it. And basically, there's a couple things that, that you can look for if, if you're doing that. If you're looking to lease a space um, and it just happens that this one is new construction, right? So you can get a traditional loan. And the traditional loan is going to be probably the hardest to qualify for um, because what I learned is that they have certain nuances. There's this debt to uh, income. income ratio, right? And normally we'd qualify and just fine. And it's basically a number, right? And they want you to be at least above one to 1. 1.4. 1. 
which traditionally Lance and I are at a two, but in their calculations, we are at a one and a 0.9. Because they didn't include something, right? Because for them, they couldn't include our K1s. Which for us, as if you're, if you're, if you're an avid listener, you know that our K1s are fairly, are fairly significant because we keep our salaries low and yep. we eat at the end. Yep. So K1s is your pass through from your companies down to you. So we didn't qualify for that. So the other way you can do is get a commercial loan. And this commercial loan, normally it stays within the bank. And the reason why the other one's harder is because they basically generate the loan and then sell it out to the market, to Fannie, to Freddie, or to whoever. Some right? other third party, yeah. Right? Um, that one, I think that we will be able to get. Um, and it should be just fine. We'll see in a little bit. But the third is an SBA 504. So that's a small business administration loan. So if you're a little bit newer to the game or maybe your, your financials are just a little bit di- you know, different for whatever reason, how that works, it's pretty interesting, is that the SBA will loan out 40% of your whatever you're, you're basically purchasing. A bank partners with them for 50% and you only have to pay 10%. But, but the caveats are closing costs are a little bit higher and fees. Okay, that's fine. But you can't pay it down without a penalty. And in our case, that's not that great because what if, what if we wanted to sell this? Like you right. pay it all down. You pay it all down. <laughs> yep. Um, so um, we'll see. We'll keep you posted. But and so yeah, did you, Alex? Is we're we're, we're exploring all avenues. Ho- yes. ho- hopefully, hopefully the traditional just works. Because no, yeah. the traditional won't. The commercial probably will. The commercial, I mean. Sorry. Yep. Yep. The commercial one. Yep. But I mean, where it's not has not to be this hybrid split between. Yeah. The SBA. Yep. We don't want to do that. Yep. Unless we have to. Then. Yeah. Well, if we have to, yeah. yeah, you just can't. You just gotta keep it fixed. You gotta keep that, keep that, uh, paying that uh, interest, huh? Yeah, you just can't, can't pay it off, huh? I mean, I'd be okay with that. It's just, yeah, you just forget about the interest. I guess that's kind of a bummer. Yeah, but next we're gonna bring in actually someone from our firm. We sent him to a conference, and he's gonna give us the Ross report. AKA what the heck. I love it. Heck. I love it. The Ross report. Yep. But do you like that? AKA what the heck? A because his last name is heck. heck. So <laughs> And we'll see I we'll, will be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing it then. Okay, here we go with Ross. All right, we are here with Ross Heck. Uh with the segment is called You Didn't Hear This. It's called the Ross Report, AKA okay. What the Heck. That's the first time I'm hearing it too. Yep. <laughs> Let's eat the mic. All yeah. right. So tell us where you went. What was the conference? Atlanta, Georgia. Conference was the Green Build Expo. And what made you decide to go to that? Because you kind of had a little bit of a pick, a choice. Yeah, yeah. There were a couple options. Uh, chose that one because it's all about sustainability and construction. And that's a important issue for me, I'd say. And there were just a lot of reasons to go. Primarily, uh, Barack Obama was the keynote speaker. So definitely wanted to see him, regardless of politics. Uh, just really important character in the U.S. So... It was really cool to be able to see him in person. Yeah. Did you have something that? Yeah, no, that's awesome. How close did you get to him? Because I didn't know that he was, B- B-Rock was there. Did you yeah. high five him? Barrio? Oh, no, I wasn't close enough to high five, but like probably 100 feet away. Wow. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Was so it, were you taller or was he taller? Because he's a tall guy. And you're a tall guy. I think I'm taller. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know why you're not the president then. Just switch <laughs> places. So tell us about how is that speech? Uh, how was was the atmosphere different because he was there? I mean, he's huge. It's yeah. Barack. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know what to expect coming in because I was the first keynote speaker and it was on Wednesday. Uh, so I got in hour early and uh, yeah, apparently should be there a couple hours or three hours early. So if I showed up at five o'clock in the morning, that's probably the right time. But I got there at seven, so I could have sat closer, but it still worked out entirely. I was there before he even started. Um, but yeah. The atmosphere was people were definitely looking forward to it. That was the main event of the entire conference. And it was the first thing. Yeah. So the conference was going on the whole week. Uh, but Wednesday is kind of when everything really hit the fan. And that's when it really started. Okay, cool. Yeah. So what did you think about his speech or uh, what was it that he is kind of like a Q&A? Yeah, definitely a Q&A. It seemed like it wasn't too prepared. It was kind of just kind of going off of a couple questions that the presenter or the interviewer had for him that started off kind of morning talk show vibe. Like, what's life like after the presidency? Uh, how are the kids adjusting to life outside the White House? So they how, had to get through the basics first. Well, answer that. How is life after the presidency? Oh, he's definitely, seems relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, he said, kids, he, he made the joke, uh, none of them ever grew up in the White House, so they don't know how the kids are going to adjust. Uh, but I think he's enjoying it a lot, you know, getting a lot more sleep. Uh, and he's always a relaxed guy, and it's kind of like an extra notch for him. Nice. I wonder if he still smokes cigarettes now. Probably not. Right. Honestly, did, did I wonder if he does. That was one of his very few vices. So. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know, it's a tangent. Take out the stress of the presidency, might not need it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, give us a lay of the convention. Like what kind of events did they have? What kind of booths did they have? What kind of classes did they have? So they had a bunch of products in the main expo hall. And I didn't spend too much time there. There was obviously time killer more of, more so between classes. But I didn't realize how many classes I was going to be able to get into. And as soon as I realized, oh, my pass works for pretty much everything, I just went to classes pretty much all day, every day. Yep. And so there was a lot of uh, materials. I got like a list of few things, uh, things that we could use in potential projects. Uh, they were looking at green roof assemblies. That was something that I was always interested in beforehand. Uh, so it was just kind of seeing what their layout was, seeing a nice detailed section of their product. Uh, ZipTech system, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is the like green sheathing product. Yes, yep. So that's something that I liked a lot because we just recently did the design build for the tiny home and then Mark II and to not have to do sheathing. And then the weather barrier, it's just all in one system where you just put up panels and then tape the joints. Yep. That seemed pretty ideal. And then there's no punctures in like a Tyvek product or something like that. So I've had a contractor tell me that yep. he thinks the next lawsuit is actually going to come against these zip. You know what I'm talking about, the green board. And he says, here's why. He goes, because what you're supposed to do is how you're supposed to tape them. Like you're supposed to like clean it off, put the tape on, smooth it out. And he goes, no one does it that way. So he thinks what that they, they, what do they do? Yeah, what other option is there? Oh, they, you know how it's done. They just, it's just some guy who does it and just probably runs his hand over it. Okay. Right. But this is what I'd get. Okay. Your other choice is Tyvek. How many holes are there, even though you try to catch them all with the nail going through or the tape not working perfectly, or like, I don't buy that tie, Tyvek is, is better than that. I feel like everyone kind of, yeah. you know. We got some guff about Zip versus Tyvek, and everybody said, oh, was it because it's cheaper? You know, I went, and, I went and redid the math and everything, and it's about the same, honestly, especially if you do a project like ours where you have to have a third-party inspector. So wouldn't you rather do the, the, the green stuff? It's all right. Uh, I, but this whole... I'm not. I, I don't think you save time. I don't think you save money. I think it's a wash. I think you're taking an equal risk either way. I think. I just think it's a different. It's a different product. Maybe. Maybe you save a little bit of time, but like I don't know. Tyvek. Tyvek is pretty fast. You know. What I, hate, I. I just don't. I don't know. What I hate on these big buildings is I hate having it exposed to weather. So I rather just have that. That's what I rather have. Even if it's the same cost, be like, okay, great. Even if you don't tape it right away. And maybe you do like at least you're covered from day one. Oh, that's a good point. I don't mind that. Yeah. I, but then I, then you just push me over the edge. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So that was cool. What, what else was cool at? Uh, so the other main keynote speaker on Thursday was Jeannie gang of studio gang architects. Yeah. She's cool. Yeah. So a uh, woman that designed the tallest building in Chicago. So the tallest building in the world is designed by her designed by a woman. Uh, and that's, uh, the Vista Tower in Chicago. She also did that Aqua Tower in Chicago that looks like the heating fins. The Vista Tower is the tallest building in the world? Designed by a woman. Oh. oh. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was less uh, sustainability focused. It was more just a slideshow of cool projects, but yeah. cool nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, went to a mass timber class, and so I'm definitely interested in mass timber construction yep. since it's kind of on the rise. Uh, it was mostly just gener general stuff, but just seeing how uh, things come together, but also realizing that uh, it's not a system that there's only one way of doing right now. You know, you might go to different suppliers and they only have products for platform framing versus balloon framing. Uh, but they did talk about the sustainability of it, which was important and interesting because uh, while deforestation is a huge issue worldwide, the U.S. in the past hundred years, are, we have a very healthy forest system in yeah, North America. and Canada. Yeah. So it's actually... Could we stop to clarify that? Just, for, just so people know, it's, it's not being insensitive. In, in Brazil, where a lot of it's coming is for agriculture, um, you know, 
for, for cows that they're deforesting the rainforest. Up here, and especially in Canada, the way if you cut down, it's getting replanted or it's replanting itself. So there's enough that it's, it's not that critical of a, an issue. Right, and there's far less biodiversity up here than they're experiencing down in the rainforest, so yep. less extension, less extinction. We aren't shipping wood from the rainforest. Right. And well, then we, there's actual benefits of actually spacing out areas of growth so that, uh, you know, beetle kill pine, the uh, emerald ash borer beetles in Colorado are an issue, just kind of giving them less room to spread, less room for forest fires to spread. So, oh, so they'll like cut. Yeah. So there's uh, actual uh, benefits, and then you can have that primal or whatever the first level layer of growth just kind of come back and take over where you cut down trees. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, the fires. If you haven't seen uh, what a fire can do and how big it can grow, it's it's pretty devastating. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I feel like you got. Oh yeah. There's a ton more. How much time we got? Yeah. yeah. Hit some highlights, man. I'm a note guy. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, so going back to Obama, too, uh, some of his cool points or just kind of main takeaways were uh, the movement for sustainability that's kind of got to come from the lower class up. They're the most susceptible and uh, went political with it, and it's just kind of the most susceptible people are going to feel the effects first. But then the problem is making sustainability affordable. You know, you have lead raters, and there's things like lead where uh, you have to pay for a certification, essentially. And all the products that are associated with sustainable design are more expensive. So it's just kind of making that level of sustainability affordable to lower classes. And that's things like in California where, yeah, it's great. They're making all these rules and things, but they're pushing people out of uh, places, lower class and middle class people are being pushed out of places they've grown up and lived their whole life. Yep. And, and, and I don't think it's as simple as everyone else makes it because basically... It, one simple way is that you, it's not simple, but you petition the government to make these green rules, right? Mm -hmm. But the counter to that is that, hey, you could make these green choices yourself. Let's take college students, for example, right? Let's take CU just because we know it, not to pick on CU. It's the same for, for all colleges, right? They're, they're building new buildings all the time. They're building new dorms. They're building new fitness centers. They're building new science centers. The students can know the budget because it's, it's uh, public, right? And they could say, no, 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 we want our money because we, we're the ones paying to make this 100% renewable energy, 100% green. What it then comes down to, so you have a voice to do it, but then, oh, but do you actually need a science center? Yes or no. Like, do you need this other stuff? And the same thing for me. I could put solar panels on my roof or I could get an electric car, but I need a, I need a truck because I'm basically a contractor. And until Tesla came out with their $37,000 truck, there wasn't an electric truck that was within price range, but you have to balance that with, oh, the baby needs food, right? <laughs> you mm -hmm. need to make your mortgage payment. So even if you do make the government do it, it all trickles down until it makes sense economically, which I think everyone can agree to, hopefully, is that, oh, if it's cleaner and cheaper, why would you, why would you not do it? It just, just makes sense unless, you know, you're just being pigeon head, pig headed for whatever reason, and that's fine. Yep. But um, I think everyone has more power than they think and i think there's more nuance than people think also yeah yeah that's something where i would have liked to uh, overall it was a general conversation uh only had an hour hour and a half and half of it was dedicated to just kind of catching up with obama uh but one thing that was lacking was i guess statistics because i would love to have more statistics to share on how, what kind of ways are we able to make pr improvements going forward absolutely uh Another interesting thing that learned was uh, kind of making adaptations for moving into the future in design. Uh, so designing building systems and operations and orientations and whatnot going forward, uh, planning for the big issue of climate change. And uh, they were taking reports in Portland, Oregon was the example site. And climate zone is actually going to be shifting. So all around the world, we're going to see areas that are climate zone of four go to climate zone three and our area of climate zone five going to four or even lower. Yep. So it's just kind of planning ahead for things that are going to happen in the next 50 years. Um, and then that's... That's a macro look indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was just really interesting to see how... The main takeaway is just make a airtight building regardless. You want that, and then you can control ventilation and things like that. But as long as you're airtight, airtight you have the option to kind of go either direction. 
Okay, so that helps even in warmer and cooler. Just airtight is kind of the, if yeah. you have a thing to do, airtightness is the way to go. They yeah, say. and then put your money into building systems and then design, obviously, have large south-facing windows for heat gain, but then just making sure that it's optimized for solar shading. Cool, cool. Overall, did you like it? Was it fun? Did you recommend it? Was, what it did was you think? definitely awesome. Uh, first ever business uh, conference kind of thing. So it felt like an adult for sure. Yep. Uh, it was definitely very fun too. Uh, we even got around. Uh, one, oh, one of the main things that I liked was the area we were in. It was right next to everything in Atlanta. Mercedes-Benz Stadium was right oh. there. So that was something that was really interesting to me because college uh, was in lighting design certificate program and our big capstone project was on Mercedes-Benz Stadium because my capstone teacher was one of the lighting designers for that project. So we had access to all the CAD files and whatnot. Yep. And they had the big closeout party there. So they just kind of bring everything together. They put everyone down on the field. It was like... I think I called you and you said yeah, you were you on called the called me and I was, I was like, well, guess where I am? <laughs> I'm on the field. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> throwing... Footballs at a cardboard cutout of Julio Jones. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, so you definitely recommend it for people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And what was the conference again? Green Build Expo next year is in San Diego. Cool, cool. Yeah. So I know we're cutting short on time. Uh, next podcast, if you find other things you want to talk about, we, we can have you back for sure. Um, but, but thanks for going and letting everyone know about it. Yep, thank you. Any parting words, Mr. Yes. Al Gore? Uh, please leave us a review. Um, if you do so. Five star. Lance says five star. I think, I hope you agree. Uh, send me a snapshot of it. I'll send you a free PDF of our book, The Creativity Code. And also, if you are thinking about learning Revit, we just interviewed someone where someone at their firm only knows SketchUp. Someone also only knows AutoCAD. This person, she only knows, I mean, she knows Revit. If you are those other people that don't know Revit, you need to learn Revit. And the best way to do it, I believe, is through RevitRocketShip.com. Because not only do we teach hundreds of students, we teach have taught hundreds of professionals. It's the system that we use at our firm, and we improve it every year. And we you get a free template. There, That other firm is not even working off a good template. Holy cow. Get your stuff together. Get your life. Get to RevitRocketShip.com um, and do that if you need to learn it. If you would like to be a guest on this podcast, please email me, Lance, at lmc at f9productions.com. That is L as in Lance, M as in Michael, C as in Cat, at f9productions.com because I am going to be starting another uh, ep- podcast, uh, sister podcast episode weekly thing to this to this one that we do on Friday, every, every, every Friday. It's going to be the Monday morning coffee with inside the firm and we're going to be interviewing other architects um, but a, a larger variety of business professionals because as entrepreneurs we value what other people have went through what they have to say what they can do what they can't do um, and learn from them so get in touch with me if you would like to be a guest on this podcast but it won't be the friday version it'll be the monday version and it'll be called monday morning coffee with inside the firm with that we'll see you next week <laughs>